OK, so we've seen an awful lot of what LightWave has in the way of tools and so forth for beginning with rigging. The next thing that needs to be understood is how these tools work in terms of their evaluation order. All of these different ways that we can apply motion to items in our scenes have to, of course, be calculated and evaluated. But they do not talk to one another necessarily. And there is an order in which the different transformations, as we would call them, are applied to your items. Getting this right is another one of those fundamental things to be aware of when you are rigging. Else, you will try and rely upon a tool to control one aspect of something, attempt to use a different tool to control something further down the hierarchy or potentially further up the hierarchy, and then when you come to perform animation, you will find that the thing comes apart and breaks, or simply fails to work entirely. And the reason for that is almost always a failure to observe the correct evaluation order of motion. So let's take a look at this evaluation ordering. The first things to be evaluated, although it may seem like a statement of the obvious, are the actual keyframes themselves. You can think of these, if you like, as the FK values that are applied to items. And these are the keyframes that appear either in our graph editor or, of course, in our timeline. These are a value that is set to an item in order to animate it in some fashion or other, as we see there. Therefore, this is a motion and it is evaluated. And this is the very first thing that gets evaluated. Pretty simple, really. Item two are graph editor expressions. Those are expressions that are set up here in the graph editor. And any kind of motion which is controlled via a graph editor expression will be evaluated immediately after the keyframes. This, of course, is so that if you are taking the keyframes of one item and using them in an expression to control the motion of another item, those keyframes have to be evaluated first. Then, of course, the expression can get those values in order to apply them to the next item in the evaluation stack. Next up, we have motion modifiers. These come in two places. We have the modifiers here in the graph editor itself. These are applied first. And then we have the modifiers in the motion options panel. All of these fellows here. Any of these that are added are, of course, evaluated next. This also points to why I said graph editor expressions previously, because, of course, we have expression motion modifier that is available. So this would, of course, be evaluated after graph editor expression. And similarly, in the graph editor modifiers, there is also an expression option. Might seem a little unusual that you have these two places to use expressions in graph editor directly or via a modifier, but they are there. Next in line, we have target, pole, IK, and same as item. All of these guys here on the main part of our motion options panel and all of the options that are in there, including, of course, the goal. You'll notice I put these next to one another because these all evaluate together, or at the very least, they cross-reference one another. This means that you can have one item, say, at the top of a chain, which is targeting something, and then below it, it can have children, which are operating on IK and reaching for goal somewhere. And that top item can move around following its target and the IK will stick as it should. Alternatively, you could have an IK chain which is doing stuff and reaching for its goal. And below it, you could have another item which is targeting something. And as the IK chain moved, the item below the IK, which was doing the targeting, would still work correctly. So all of these mainline options that we see on the motion panel work together. They can talk to one another and see one another's results and share one another's values. They are interoperable. That's important. We will see a lot of that. The next thing that we have in our list is after IK. What we will notice with some of our motion modifiers is that they have an after IK switch. This shifts their evaluation from being evaluated before IK to being evaluated after IK. This incidentally works for modifiers that are found here on the main motion options panel, not for those in the graph editor. Those fellows do not have after IK options. But for the ones found here, which isn't all of them, I must point out, it's only select ones. And you will always find them because when you have the option, it will be quite clearly there for you. 
these can be evaluated after IK. So that means that you can have a chain that is operating on IK or same as item or target, because of course, when it says after IK, it means the entirety of this motion panel's various options, not purely IK, which is understandable. After IK, poll, target, SAI would be quite lengthy. But you can have items operating on IK, same as item, whatnot, have other items embedded in that chain or at the end of that chain using motion modifiers, which can be set to after IK. So that means they are able to see the results of whatever has happened in the IK chain and the values. Then lastly, and somewhat curiously, we have graph editor expressions appearing again. The reason I have this again is not because graph editor expressions are evaluated once more at the end of the stack. That is not true. Moreover, the story is a little bit different when it comes to graph editor expressions, and putting them second was sort of a lie. What actually happens is that graph editor expressions are evaluated any time that keyframes are created. If, somehow, during the use of these modifiers here, or the IK, or these modifiers here, or anything else, keyframes become created during that stack of evaluations, the graph editor expressions will re-evaluate. In short, graph editor expressions evaluate after keyframes, and keyframes can be recreated. There aren't many tools that do it. The primary one is the old Motion Baker plugin here, which has the extra channels mode. With that on, you'll see that we get these after IK x, y, and z channels appearing for the item in our graph editor. Thus, an expression can reference the after ik motion channel. What this means, of course, is that the regular keyframes are applied, then the ik is applied, the motion baker records the ik motion to these extra after ik channels, and the expression is then able to read these channels. Not something that will come up very often and a very limited use, but it is a fact and it is there. So that is pretty much the full story of motion control evaluation ordering in Lightwave. However, there is also another kind of evaluation that takes place in Lightwave, which is pertinent to rigging, and that has to do with objects themselves, specifically their mesh deformations. Mesh deformations are of course separate to the motion control, but are still happening after it. Any items that are deforming our objects will of course need to have all of their motions evaluated first, and the actual mesh is evaluated thereafter. Now that's not the order that's important. What is important is the order of evaluations of the mesh. For instance, subdivision order. If we're using a subdivision surfaces mesh, which certainly for animation GANIC characters is the preferred choice, then we have options as to when that subdivision will be applied. If we look here at a character which is using subdivision surfaces, we can see, of course, that when he is deforming, his deforms are nice and smooth, just as we would expect but this is because we have his subdivision order here set to last. If we set it to first, we see a different result. Reason why? Because in this case, the mesh is subdivided first, then the deformation gets applied. When we subdivide later, it is the cage, which of course is this mesh, which is deformed first, and then that is subdivided, giving us a smoothed result. In this case, he's being deformed by bones, so having after bones is no different than last because there are no other deformation tools being used on this mesh that need to be evaluated. Therefore, after bones is late enough. You can see, of course, we have after morphing, after displacement, after motion. After motion is, of course, if the mesh itself is being animated, and then last, when it just occurs after everything. This line between after bones and after displacement is an important one to keep your eye on, most of all if you are using displacement maps on characters, such as are derived from ZBrush or Mudbox or whatever. When you're using displacement maps on a character, clearly, of course, have an awful lot of teeny tiny little details that are being applied. In that case, to subdivide the mesh before applying the displacement. Otherwise, if you don't, then you don't have enough polygons. Of course, assuming that you're using a nice high level of subdivision, you would not have enough polygons to capture the detail of the displacement. 
Therefore, when using characters which have displacement maps to give them surface detail, we set them to subdivide after bones, such that the displacement still comes through nicely. This lets us segue quite nicely into the Deform tab here, where of course we have the different displacement options. And if I just activate the nodes there, even though there are none applied, you can see the same option exists both for just the standard textured displacement as well as the bump displacement. But the displacement, whichever one or ones you have applied, you can use multiple, also has an order, which you can see mirrors the order or rather sits in between the orders that we saw in subdivision. As such, if you are using a character who is going to be animated with bones and have a displacement map, before bones is not what you want. You would set your displacement order to before world displacement in that case. You could also have some other manner of displacement and be putting that on at a different point in the evaluation stack of displacements. This gives you a fair bit of flexibility for using different displacements in different ways and how any kind of subdivision will either smooth out the displacements that you apply or how the subdivision will capture the fine detail of the displacements that you apply. These guys here in the displacement drop down are always added on last. So no matter what else you've got going on, any of these that you apply will happen after everything else has happened. With a couple of small caveats, such as the Joint Morph and Joint Morph Plus, which of course drive a morph map going on in the character. That of course brings us back to whether we are subdividing before or after morphing and so on. And once again with other displacements, whether they are occurring after morphing, which all of these displacements up here must do. There is no option, as you can see, for before morphing. Otherwise, that is pretty much the full story. All of the different kind of evaluations and the order of application wave of those evaluations. And as we go into the training further and further, we will, of course, see examples of all of this at work, which will help you to understand the circumstances where you wish to use different options, all of which will be pretty cool. Also, highly important, since we are talking about evaluations and their orders, is something you will encounter called the cyclic item dependency. For instance, let's say I take this camera here and I set it, just using standard same as item constraint here, to follow the position of the light. That's all well and good. Obviously, the camera follows where the light is in space. But now let's say that I take the light and tell it to follow the position of the camera. Soon as I hit same as item here, we get this flash down at the bottom, one cyclic depths, camera to light. The camera is following the light's position and the light is following the camera's position. Clearly, this can't work. And very obviously, you have a cyclic dependency. Camera follows light, follows camera, follows light, follows camera, and so on. This is no good, and having cyclic dependencies anywhere in a rig or setup will cause you major problems. Or rather, it'll just mean that things don't work. Cyclic dependencies aren't confined to just the same as item control here. You could just as easily have one expression that references one item and that item have an expression that references the other. But what is important is the order. So if my camera used an expression to follow the light, and then the light used the motion options panel here to refer to the camera, that would not be a cyclic dependency error. Reason why? Because we would have cheated through the evaluation order. One of these relationships would have been evaluated first, and the next one evaluated second. So whilst you must always try and avoid cyclic dependency errors, you can sometimes hop over them by looking at the evaluation order, such that camera follows light, then light follows camera, then nothing else, end of the evaluation stack. And again, within the training and some of our example setups, we will see where we use this trick to help ourselves gain functionality that we otherwise would be unable to have. Of course, notice that how I had that set up there was using the position. There are other instances where you get what appears to be a cyclic dependency error, but that really is not. For instance, let's say I take the camera here and I target it at the light. So now the camera points at the light. I can similarly take the light, target it to the camera. This way the two items target 
one another and it all works perfectly. Why is this? It's because, of course, the targeting is on rotation. The rotation of the light is dependent on the position of the camera. And similarly, the rotation of the camera is dependent on the position of the light. The two things do not conflict. And so you do not actually have a dependency error problem. Unfortunately, what you do have in Lightwave, as you can see down at the bottom here, the dependency warning has come up again. Basically, Lightwave detects the dependency based upon which items are set where. In this case, both items reference one another in the Motion Options panel. And consequently, Lightwave thinks that there is an error when in fact there is not. This is sort of a double-edged sword, unfortunately, because on the one hand, you can have this error and say, well, that's great, I can ignore it. But on the other, Lightwave doesn't have some kind of panel box that shows us all of our cyclic dependencies. It only gives us this one little single line warning, which means that if I've got something set up like this, which I know works, but I accidentally at some other point have another dependency that doesn't, Lightwave has no way to inform me of it. So you really do have to keep check of these things for yourself. In a situation like this, the way to set it up and not get the error would be to do something of this fashion, use a little bit of hierarchy. So I've added a null here, and I've set the camera to instead of targeting the light, it targets the null. I now take the light, make the null its parent. Now I move the light, not by moving the light itself, but by moving the null. You get exactly the same behavior as we had before, but Lightwave no longer detects this as a dependency. So, something to keep your eyes out for, and something which of course with the correct setup can avoid and get right.